Hey everyone, uh, welcome back to the next installment of Stoss's detailed interior tour of the Type 7. So using Wolfpack's boat, they've, had a, they've done a well-made boat here and it's got enough details here throughout the boat where I can go through and actually talk about the components of each, each compartment and to the extent I that, that a particular component in a compartment is not modeled uh, in this video, there are a few things that aren't modeled in the forward control room, I am going to uh, bring up some pictures to supplement uh, the video and su uh, supplement what I'm talking about just so that people can actually see what things look like. It's not not too many cases but there may be seven or eight pictures that we'll show so we'll transition to those and I'll explain um, the components as we're as we're looking at those individual uh, comp uh, components and so we're going to do this video on the forward control, forward section of the control room, right? There's and really the attack periscope well, which is right here. I'm going to use that as kind of the delineation between forward and aft. It's all one compartment, really, essentially. But um, just in the interest of time, there's so many components in the control room itself, uh, let alone in the in the forward portion and the after portion, that it really warrants. Uh, two videos, and so we'll do, we'll do it that way. So I'll really, I'll start from uh, kind of forward and work my way aft, work my way around the uh, the periphery of the compartment, and just talk about it really as much as I can in here uh, that I think would be would be interesting. And so, just I guess a little little uh, something I didn't mention in the previous video where I, when I covered the um, this this forward battery section here. Really, around the forward battery is actually uh, fuel internal fuel bunker number two. Uh, there were two internal fuel bunkers up, uh, in addition to the fuel that was kept in the uh, in the fuel ballast tanks and the saddle tanks. And so that actually skirts around the forward battery here, and it actually juts into the control room a little bit. So you've got, you know, cut off right about here and then all up around the uh, the forward battery compartment under uh, under the, the deck plates here is, is really fuel bunker number two. I didn't mention that. Um, the uh, under the control room we've got uh, main ballast tank number three so that's really divided into a port and starboard section and when we cover the after part of the control room we'll sh I will show you where those uh, where those vent levers were for those but suffice it to say it's the largest ballast tank set of ballast tanks that's on the boat uh, the boat was really des designed to be able to float on those ballast tanks alone and so these are really the, the, the largest, if you want to think of ballast tanks on the Type 7, you've got ballast tank 1, 5, 3, and then 2 and 4. 1, 5, and 3 are the ones that were primarily used as ballast tanks for the entire patrol. Uh, MBTs, or what, what we like to call FBTs, fuel ballast tanks, 2 and 4 were in the saddle tanks, and those were typically filled with fuel. As fuel was burned, they were filled up with water. And so on, so so on, so on, and so forth. But under the under the floor plates here, you would have main ballast tank number three. Uh, you'd also have the negative tanks were outboard. So there were two negative tanks aboard the boat. One is outboard of right about here within the saddle tanks, outside the pressure hull, but inside the saddle tank, you've got a negative tank here on the port side, and then you've also got another negative tank here. Uh, and here are the negative tank controls. Um, we'll go over what the actual controls look like in this video. But the, the other negative tank, the starboard side negative tank, is, is outside of this pressure hole wall here inside the saddle tank. Uh, and then forward of that, so outside of the wall here, and then outside of the wall here, and extending beyond the control room a little bit, are fuel ballast tanks number four. There's one on the port side in the saddle tank and there's one on the starboard side in the saddle tank. Fuel ballast tank number four. Typically filled with fuel in what they call swim condition B, which was their swim condition A and swim condition B. Swim condition A is all tanks, uh, all ballast tanks are used as water ballast tanks. Swim condition B is um, ballast tanks one, three, and five are used as water ballast and then fuel uh, Ballast tanks two and four. We'll cover two when we get to the aft portion of the control room. Those were filled with fuel, and then um, compensating water. We'll cover the compensating water system in another video. But that basically filled uh, filled those tanks up with water as the fuel was was consumed. 
uh, and in in a sense, somewhat maintaining their weight and balance. Okay. Uh, those tanks. I mentioned these tanks just to get those out of the way because they're outside the pressure hull, and I won't. That's all I'll really cover. That's outside the pressure hull in this video. Uh, main ballast tank three is inside the pressure hull, but the other ones are outside the pressure hull. Now. The way a ballast tank works, of course, is you've got at sea, you're always keeping the bottom open and the top closed, right? Because it's just like the analogy with the, with the cup in, in water. If you put a cup upside down into water, submerge it, dunk it into water, it won't fill up with it won't fill up with water because the top is closed. There's nowhere for that air to go. It's trapped in there. Um, the the pressure of the air that's in there is preventing the water from coming in. It's the same principle with ballast tanks. The, there, the um, ballast tanks 5, which 5 is forward, and 1, which is way aft, those had no valves at the bottom. They were just open. There were open slots at the bottom, right? And then they, had, they were shut at the top and filled with air. Main ballast tanks 3, port and starboard, had Kingston valves that were under the deck plates here were actually little sockets for putting T, large T wrenches in right around in this vicinity here. While in port, they, those Kingston valves were closed, but as soon as they set sail during wartime, they would open them again, and really any time, because it's it's actually pretty laborious to, or not laborious, but inconvenient to have to take these T valves, these T wrenches, large T wrenches, and insert them into the floor here and crank those Kingston valves open. They just stayed open during during the the war during the cruise. Right, so those would be open. The, the ballast tank would be full of air. The vent, which is at the top, outside at the top, would be closed, therefore preventing the air from escaping. To dive, of course, you you would open the vents, and then the, the air it would allow the air to escape out the top. But the Kingston valves for those are in are in the floor here. You can't see them here, but they that's where they would be in real life. Um, the fuel ballast tanks two and four also had Kingston valves for their bottoms, which were also open at sea. They're not modeled here, but you would see in the real boat, you'd see a shaft for fuel, for, for, um, um, for fuel ballast tanks. Each fuel ballast tank had two Kingstons. So that would be, one would be here, there'd be a shaft sticking out here, and then there'd be another shaft that's sticking out here, which this roughly approximate it, approximates it. This may not have even been a valve. It's show, as shown here, this may have been the Kingston to be a, just a little shaft sticking out here, but you would insert a wrench over the top of that of that um, male end that's sticking out here, that shaft, and then you'd crank that open. The other one, the, so uh, that was the starboard side. On the port side for fuel ballast tank four, the other Kingston, there would be one sticking out here between the between the uh, this fire control box and then the chart table. You'd have one sticking out here, and then the other one would be sticking out right here. So you, those would be cranked open before the boat left port, and then, of course, you'd, your ballast tanks are full of air. Uh, water won't come in, right? So those, so that covers really the ballast tanks that are sort of in this particular vicinity right here. Um, moving on to the really the forward uh, bulkhead of the control room here. Down in the corner here, this is not modeled in this in Wolfpack here. If you look at pictures of 995, you do see what looks like a canister here. Um, I'll switch over now to um, to a um, a real picture here. So you can see here, this is actually an image from the U570 U570's control room. Which U570 was captured by the British in 1941, and the British took took uh, ample pictures of the interior, uh, very valuable pictures. But you can see here that this is a bucket here, a removable bucket. And what this is for is for fuel sampling. It's for sampling fuel, the fuel contents of, of fuel bunker two, the one I pointed out in the beginning of the video. Fuel bunker two sits for under the uh, under the um, officers and, and chief petty officers quarters around the battery compartment. Uh, it's a very large fuel tank. Uh, but they, they had a way to drain the contents of that as well as the contents of, um, of fuel ballast tanks number four in the forward part of the control room here into this bucket. 
and I can explain how that sampling worked. But at any rate, this is what the what a bucket would have actually looked like in a in a in a, in a wartime active duty boat. On 995, you if you look at pictures of it, like you said, there is a container there, but it's been welded shut, and you can see these these pipes going these drain pipes going down to it, but it doesn't look like it's designed that way because it's a it's, it essentially just looks like it's a bundle of pipes that's been welded shut with the, in, in this little cylindrical container. That really was the place for the bucket, the removable bucket. Okay, so going back to the game, how did this actually look work in real life? Um, you've got up at the top here. You've got a you've got a um, a measuring cock, a measuring selector cock. You're gonna call it that one call it that. And what this is for is for testing the contents of uh, fuel bunker number two up here. The way it worked is there were several lines that fed out of fuel bunker two up into this 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 uh, measuring selector. And what they could do is they could set, set it in the center in the center position and it would equalize the pressure among all the pipes. And it would also equalize the it would also f allow the the center pipe the measuring pipe uh, that that drain that the pipe that drained directly into the bucket over here to fill up with fuel and or water. As as you know, fuel is lighter than water. Fuel will float. The principle operates. It operates on the principle that the, that fuel will always rise to the surface or be at least higher than the water, right? And so what happens is you select this. It equalizes the pressure and fills that center pipe up with some mixture, or I should say, some a level of fuel and an amount of water. And the, the fuel will be at the top, and the water will be at the bottom. So then what they would do, once that was done, is they would, they would switch this over to the left or to the other position. That would then isolate that center pipe, and then they could drain that cent just the contents of that center pipe. Since they've isolated it, they would drain it into the bucket. They would drain it into the bucket, the whole thing into the bucket. Um, or, excuse me, they would drain it until they saw water coming out, essentially, because what's going to come out first is... Um, is the um, is uh, the fuel that's sitting there? There is wa there's pressure being exerted on this on this tank by the uh, and I think I, I touched on the header tank in the previous video, but there's a there's a tank under the winter garden that's filled up with with compensating water, which is which is effectively cooling water that's been run through the diesel engine, led up to the header tank under the winter garden, and then that um, that uh, pressure head is what directs that water down uh it creates the gravity that the height above the, of the winter garden above the rest of the boat creates that pressure head that's going to uh direct that that water effectively downwards by way of gravity and create pressure to to push this water out that water and fuel out and so by way of that pressure head that center pipe will drain whoever is checking will watch the bucket until fuel st until water starts coming and then they'd stop it they'd, they'd select the and cut it off, okay? And then they would take the bucket back to the diesel engine room where there was a measuring device, there was a chart, and they could say by how much fuel they actually got that was in that center pipe, how much they could extrapolate that over the the contents of the entire tank, and then they knew their measurement of the, of the forward tank, okay? So that's how that worked. There was also a, a, the opportunity to use dipsticks, Dipsticks. I didn't mention this in the forward in the bow torpedo room, but basically, um, like the water contents of those of the trim tank up there and the torpedo compensating tanks up there were checked by way of dipstick. Dip it down, come by just like just like your dip oil dipstick in your car. Down, up, check the level. Same thing. There was a way to do that with with the with the um, forward um, fuel tank under here, or the fuel bunker, but. It just wasn't very accurate, right? Because you've got a you got fuel floating on water, so it's relatively meaningless. You've got this really the same amount, if you want to think of the same amount of fluid in there. You're just, you know, so it's it's actually more worthwhile and valuable to use this this measuring selector here in order to isolate that center pipe and then drain out the amount of fuel that's in there, and then use that like a chart, a measuring chart in the diesel room to figure out how much fuel is then in the entire forward tank okay okay so that's that's the that's what this is up here um that's that's for testing the measuring the contents the fuel contents that remain in the for, forward 
internal bunker here. You'll notice here there's a valve here. In real life, there have been another valve here. There are two, uh, two valves here, but you can see this pipe running down here that would empty out into the bucket. This is coming from um, the port uh, fuel ballast tank number four in the saddle tank. It's coming. This pipe is coming from way up here because what's happening is you're opening this up and letting it drain in here. Again, it's under pressure because of the, the water in the header tank. Uh, you're letting that amount drain out here and you're doing it from the top because, again, fuel is going to be rising to the top. And so the, the measurement is coming from all the way up here. The, the sample is coming from all the way up here. And so if you see water, you know you're, you're empty, right? You're, 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 you're um, out of fuel in that, in that, in that bunker, okay? And it's the same thing over here. They had a set of valves over here, and then the pipe would run. It's actually probably it right here. The pipe would come over here and then drain into the bucket. So they could test both fuel ballast tanks, number four. Um, and it, it happened where they they would typically start burning the, the fuel that was in one of the, a pair of regulating tanks because they also kept fuel in those, a pair of those. And then they'd move on to the saddle tanks because it makes sense to move on to burn the fuel in those next because then they can be converted to water ballast, which is advantageous. So you've got more water ballast to work with. Uh, and then they would move, finally move into burning the fuel that's in the internal bunkers. So that being said, it, it had, did happen where, you know, they're burning, they're, they're, they're pulling fuel out of the, um, out of the fuel bunkers, the, you know, two and four, and all of a sudden, you know, there'd be a, the chief machinist might be topside and he's looking back at the exhaust and saying, okay, something's wrong here. We got water going on here. And so there was an instance where I can't remember the boat number, but you know, the, the chief machinist noticed that ran back to engine rooms. What the hell are you guys doing? You got water going on in there. I could, I could tell by the sound of the engine. I could tell by the, the color, by the exhaust that I saw topside. And sure enough, when they were draining the, the fuel out of the fuel ballast tanks into the gravity tank that's in the diesel room, which fed the, then feeds the diesel engines with fuel, they were letting water go in there because they somebody was not be, not uh, being diligent about checking uh, how much uh, checking this up here to see how much uh, to see whether water was coming out or not, you know. So, so that's that's the this fuel bucket here. That's the fuel sampling in the forward part of the control room. There's a there's a similar situation going on aft, uh, which we'll talk about. Which actually they this here is the the modeling of the bucket that that was existing back here but we'll talk about that when we go back there um so that's really what that's really what those what, what's what's going on here so um we talked already about these here so this is the this is the vent for main ballast tank number five main ballast tank number five is I mentioned that in the bow torpedo room video. That's way forward in front of the torp effectively in front of the torpedo tubes, and around the you know in the f forward in front of in front of the bulkhead in front of the torpedo tubes, way up in the bow. That's the vent. This was standard on all types sevens. Was here with main. You find this wheel always. This other wheel is the and I mentioned this sort of at length in the bow torpedo room video. But this is the vent. This is after 1943, which U995 was built in either in or yeah it was built in 1943 I believe. The decision was made to move that vent wheel for the for the bow buoyancy tank to um, to the control room and that's this. Okay, this is not a ballast vent. It's it's the venting. It's the vent wheel for for the bow buoyancy tank. I won't cover again what the bow buoyancy tank was, but suffice it to say, on a standard type 7C, you would see you wouldn't see a wheel here at all. The wheel, the vent wheel for it would be up in the bow torpedo room, and I showed where that was in the other video. What was here was that the speaker was actually here, okay, on a, on a standard Type 7. Like if you look at pictures of U-570, you'll see um, the vent wheel is here, and then the speaker is here. This wheel wouldn't be here. But again, you see it in all this, this second wheel makes it into everything because all we have is, and thankfully all we have is 995. And so they see what you're seeing is a late war change. Totally, a totally uh, a change that totally makes sense because that had to be open uh, in order to not slow the dive down. But regardless, I mean that's that's what this is. So you're not you're not opening both ballast tanks here. This is really what's opening main ballast tank five forward. This one is just the small bow buoyancy tank to prevent an air pocket 
from being cap being trapped in there that would slow the dive down. Okay. Uh, so the, the next thing that makes sense to talk about is the drain valves down here. So you've got these are part of the um, part of the flooding and, and draining system. Um, so that would be like in German a flut und Lenzanlage. Lenzen is to drain, to get water out of the boat. Uh, you've got several here. They're modeled somewhat accurately. There's actually one that's missing. There would be one right here that kind of juts into the room a little bit. But basically what you've got here is uh, the, the drain valves. The draining would happen by way of the bilge pump back here, which we'll talk about. But you have to have these open then when you operate the bilge pump in order to drain to allow that water to drain out of, to allow the pump, excuse me, to push the water out of those rooms. And so, um, or suck the water rather out of those rooms into the control room through the bilge pump and outboards, right? So you've got, what you'd have up here then is you'd have one for, there's a, there was a dirty, dirty water tank that was forward here, dirty, wa dirty water tank number two. You'd have one for the S room, so that I talked about that in my second video. That's the active sonar room that was under the deck plates here. There's one to drain that. Um, there's one to um, there's the one that would jut out into the control room here is actually the one that drained the forward portion of the control room. So there were, there was a way to drain the forward portion of the control room as well. Um, you'd have one for the battery room. Again, there's a, a large battery compartment up here that's got a, a, the ability to drain. Uh, then one for the bow room, and then you've got one for um, the magazine, which is right here, uh, right outside the commander's quarters. You've got the, the magazine that contains all of your, all, or most of your deck gun and flat gun rounds. Way to drain that as well. So that's what these are. These are the valves to allow the bilge pump to suck from those compartments and then push. Bilge pump is sucking from those compartments through here, pushing it outboards. Okay? So that's the drain valves there. Uh... The other, the, another one I'm going to have to pull up a picture of uh, up here. If you look here in a real boat, you would see the the projector for the magnetic compass. So I'll, let me just switch over to that picture quickly here. So here we can see in 995 next to the speaker, this is the projector for the magnetic compass. Now, different than the gyro compass, of course, right? We all are familiar with the gyro compass system, uh, the uh, the mother compass of which was right behind the the attack periscope. Well, we'll cover that in the aft torpedo room video. And then there were several, um, what in German what they call Tochter compasses, so that would be your daughter compasses or your, or your um, compass repeaters throughout the boat, gyro compass system. Always, generally always used, very accurate, gyros, you know, a gyroscopic compass is extremely accurate. That's why it's used in practice at sea as a rule. Uh, by warships, however, you know, in the in the spirit of redundancy that's common on a submarine, you've got two of everything, and you've also got two of a compass, two compass systems. The magnetic compass system is, if you look at the at the at the front fairing of the conning tower, um, at the bottom where the where the conning tower kind of meets the top deck there, right behind the deck gun, there's a little bump that comes out of the front of the conning tower. That's actually the housing for, for the two things. One, it's the housing for the magnetic compass, and then it's also, in some boats, it was the housing for the emergency blowing system to allow a diver to go down, and if the boat was in shallow water, to hook up a hook up compressed air hose and, and salvage the boat, effectively. Um, worthless in the Atlantic, so a lot of boats got rid of that. <laughs> but um, also in that little housing up there in front of the conning tower is the, ma is the magnetic compass itself, and this is its projector. So the so if the helmsman were were sitting down here in the control room, he could he could use that. Okay, so that's what that is. Switch back here. So that's the magnetic compass projector again. You'd see it right up here. This voice pipe really belongs more over here. Um, okay, so you got the you got your uh, engine order telegraphs MTs machine telegraph. You got the um, port you got port and starboard now. Wolfpack has these backwards. A head was actually outboards and a stern was inboards. I think what happened at 995 is they used diesel, the diesel room cards, face cards, in order to make that, to to show those in the control room. But in reality, in, in the diesel room, it would be reversed such that even outboard there is 
ahead, right? But you're, since you're facing aft, it has to be reversed. But yeah, you would you, forward would be outboard and, and stern would be inboard. So they've got it backwards. Not a big deal, but that's, again, they're using 995. Um, so a part of this system are these control boxes here, one for each for each um, telegraph, port and starboard. And what these boxes basically did, they did two things. There were there were two switches on them. There was a switch at the top for each one to to desert because as everybody may or may not know, I guess there were, there were engine order telegraphs in the control in the control room. There was a set up in the conning tower at the helm station there, and then of course you've got a set in the diesel engine room, and then you've got another set in the e motor room. Okay, so but the giving of orders is happening from either the control room or the conning tower and the responding is happening from the respective engine rooms so you've got a switch on the top of each of these boxes to set three settings you've got one setting for um, the tower to be active and then the control room can read along and see what the changes are that are being made you've got another setting for the control room to be active meaning I'm pulling this and I'm seeing the order you know, I, it's, it's communicating the order, and then the tower can read along and see the changes. Or the third setting is to disable the one in, the ones in the tower and have just the control room ones being active. Okay, so that's the first set of switches. There's a second set of switches on there also, too. Uh, these actually had a sound that we were associated with them. It was not the ringing sound that you hear in Wolfpack. It was more of a buzzer sound, more of a buzzer sound. And so in German, they called it a Schnarre. So you would have a way to turn that off by way of the second setting on here. You could have you could have two different settings. You could have one that was um, that had all of the bells and whistles going on. The when I say bells and whistles, I really mean the the the, the buzzer sound. And then there was a, a horn that sounded, which I don't know what it sounded like. A horn that sounded in the e motor room. And then of course you've got the flicker lights and the and the alarm bell happening in the diesel engine room when this happens the second setting would turn all of that off so you wouldn't have any of that stuff uh, and and why would that be the case well I think the reason is obvious is because if you're on silent running you don't want buzzers you don't want bells you don't want horns honking you know it sounded like a circus down there at 200 meters you know you want everything to be silent so those those had um, the option on here each box for again there's one for port and one for starboard said had had those two options on there so that's those. The rudder stand, which is down here, uh, did indeed have a gyro compass above it like this. And it, Wolfpack has done a good job of, of modeling this. Um, the This helm station, again, these are these are electrically controlled. Uh, and this, this particular helm station would be used, I guess it's not entirely clear when it would be. It certainly wouldn't be used on the surface. On the surface, the helmsman is always up in the tower interior. And at battle stations, he was up in the tower interior, right? Because you either you've either got the attack happening from the bridge on, at night on the surface, or you've got the attack happening from the conning tower interior by way of of the uh, attack periscope. Uh, I guess you've got a third situation where you've got the you've got the uh, a, a bright night where the attack is happening from the um, night periscope here, but pretty rare. But either but even in that case, the, the helmsman would be up in the tower. For battle stations, I want to say that for other underwater travelers, certainly for pursuit by depth charges, the the um, the helmsman would be down here. It's just easier to, to have him directly here, uh, with proximity to where the commander would be, and then of course proximity to where the because the commander would want to be near the hydrophone station, and so therefore the helms it would make sense for the helmsman to be down here as well. So I believe the helmsman the helmsman was down here. Um, for for the, for those types of situations, but certainly for battle stations, he was up in the conning tower, and 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 on surface normal surface travel, he was up in the conning tower as well, All right? So, uh, so that's what he, that's kind of when this this would be used here. Um, you've got the alarm case here is is relatively accurate. It didn't say alarm on it. It did, it had a um, well, I guess it did. it did. It did say like a warning alarm or whatever on it. It was actually more over. Um, by the, the rudder indicator here, this this would have been further up here. This wasn't here, uh, but the alarm was indeed at at the helm station. There was an alarm trigger here, also up in the conning tower 
like you see in uh, in Wolfpack, there would be an alarm there as well. Uh, in the real boat, you've got a bench here. The bench, and it's not really a bench. It's actually the it's actually the chart the chart box. They kept all their navigator kept all his charts in, in this, but you'd see it come like this. And I it does it's not worthwhile doing a picture of it. You can look at you can see plenty of pictures of a control room that has it. Um, you know, it's L-shaped, it's in Das Boot, you see it in there, it's L-shaped like this, so there's a space for the helmsman to sit, and then, more importantly, there's a space for the two, um, uh, the two guys that were from the bridge watch that come down and operate the hydroplanes on a dive. But, uh, but that was a chart box, so that was actually, had the purpose of being a chart box, and it also had a, um, a collapsible seat attached to it so that the chief engineer could sit, sit there, because, of course, as I said before, the chief engineer's diving station and battle station was here at the um, directing the planesman uh, at the dive station okay he's your dive officer in Wolfpack um, but he had a seat here as well and he could he could sit down behind the planesman and monitor that, monitor them if he had to be there for a long time uh, the I talked about the scrubber units in the in the bow room video um, they had so this was the second of three there was one in the bow room one here in the control room, and then there was one in the in the aft slash e, torpedo slash e motor room. It only had spaces for four. I'm not sure why they made five bottles here. This actually it took four canisters it took of um, soda lime. Okay, so that's the, this has five. In reality, it had four, but again, I'm not going to cover how this worked. It's connected to the ventilation system, uh, and was and could introduce the soda lime in order to uh, to bind the, the, the bad elements out of the CO2 and clean the air effectively, right? So that's the scrubber unit there. The rudder indicator, rudder indicator was indeed roughly in this location, and it was here in the proximity of the uh, of the helmsman down here. Uh, the the speed log you've got you got it placed here. In reality, it was down here next between the scrubber unit and uh, this. Um, EOT control box. It was down here, uh, but you know, for ease of use, they've moved it over here, and it did indeed have an odometer on it. The Germans called that an Entf Entfernungsmelder, and there was also one up in the tower uh, that was resettable. The one down here was not resettable. The one up in the tower was o the odometer, if you want to call it, was a you were able to reset reset it and set it for a particular uh, length of of nautical miles, but I'll cover that when we get it, when we do the tower video. Uh, but yeah, but but this is one of two uh, really speed gauges or, or logs, if you will. One was here, and then the other one was up in the tower. Um, the dive plane station, very famous, uh, features prominently, of course, in Das Boot. It's a prominent feature in the control room in general. You've got really top to bottom. You've got your tachometers. You've got one for your port screw uh, port shaft and one for your starboard shaft. Uh, you've got depth gauges. Now there are not two depth gauges, not including, excuse me, ignoring the popping bag for now. Most people say, okay, oh yeah, there's two depth gauges, a shallow one, and then there's a deep one. There's actually three depth gauges here. This bad boy here is, a, is the third depth gauge and it really was in the boat. This is actually a checking gauge. So these gate, this particular gauge here, and Wolfpack does this accurately. Where you have the, um, you have the keel depth showing. This this gauge will only show zero when the boat is out of the water in dry dock, right? Now this gauge, however, ran from a, from minus ten to two hundred, and so why was that the case? It was so that you could check the other depth gauge when you were on the surface and when the um, when the top of the t of the bridge was underwater, this would then show zero. So it's probably beyond the scope of this video, but there was a, a procedure that they had done, they did before the start of the patrol called the trim versuch. Trim versuch is a is a is a trim attempt. It's not it's different than the trim dive, but part of that was actually getting slowly sinking the boat down, doing this checking by way of this gauge here, and then also determining the appropriate starting fillings for your regulating tanks. It was a way to get to really establish your starting trim for the patrol, okay? And so that's what this was used for. But that's really the third depth gauge, the circular depth gauge that you've got here. And then of course you've got this one. Very everybody's familiar with this. This is your shallow depth gauge down to 25 meters. 
You've got your deep depth gauge here down to 200 meters. The real one was much smaller than this. Uh, and that, again, that goes down to 200 meters. Uh, you've got your plane, your dive plane angle indicators here. These two are the electric indicators. They don't have the manual ones modeled, but in behind here, they, there, there were some relatively primitive looking ones that were the backups that were mechanically powered and not electrical. And so that's what those are. Everybody is familiar with those. Uh, the popping bag. Now you've got, you've got the popping bag here, popping bag column here, and then you've got the inclinometer here. Now, I guess starting with the popping bag, everybody knows the numbers on the right side. That's your that's your fine depth control where you've got your 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 fine depth gauge, right? You'd be able to, to hold a pretty precise depth by doing that. And this this sketch here is actually the is actually a, rend, a rend, rendering of the conning tower and the periscope to be able to see for the chief engineer to be able to see. And this was in the real boat as well. The chief engineer to see that when the periscope was right about at water's level, because the chief engineer's goal at periscope depth, especially during an attack, was to be not a millimeter nor not a centimeter too high or too low, to be right at that, right, to have that periscope right at the at the at the water level, so that it's really the per, the captain is the commander is keeping that periscope the size of a fist above the water. That's it practically always underwater and the chief engineer is making sure that he doesn't pop up because then then the commander the commander would have to grab for that lever on the attack periscope well and suddenly go down again and that might be too late so a, a popping up like that would could be uh, disastrous and then, and then of course um, uh, the chief engineer allowing the scope to dunk down at critical moment is also tragic and that also happened too i mean there's several instances of the skipper yelling down at the chief engineer to um keep depth because he dunked the scope on the commander at, the, at a critical moment right before the, the shot okay so this is a way for him to see okay that scope is right at right at the place i want it to be um this this here is actually a um is actually a settable indicator a um an adjustable indicator to and I guess, well, I guess before we do that, let's talk about this side here. So this side actually also had numbers on it. And, th and this is really a little known aspect of the Poppenberg. This, the numbers on here showed reserve buoyancy. In other words, how much of the volume of the boat was above the water. Okay, it would, you know, it would start tiny little numbers up here and then large numbers down here, right? Because if the water level is up here, you've just got your head of your scope sticking out. You've got practically no volume of boats sticking out of the water whereas down here you've got quite a bit and so that was useful when doing the trim as i mentioned before the trim attempt to be able to bring the boat to an exact reserve buoyancy in order to try to trim it out before the patrol started and that's why the chief engineer had numbers here he was able to see you know part of the command from the commander was bring the boat to you know 0.2 cubic meters of reserve buoyancy and trim and so he would do that and he would very very slowly get it so that that so that the water level in here hovered right at that number and he knew he was good and then they could continue with the trim fazul. okay but this here was a way to preset as a reference point the amount the the, the uh, either the depth or the reserve buoyancy that you want whatever the case may be okay so that's what that is it's a way to adjust that uh, the inclinometer is pretty self-explanatory. It just shows your, it effectively shows the pitch angle of your boat. If you want to think of it in those terms. Uh, this was not, I wouldn't say this is the typical um, construction of it. You've got 995 has this vertical version of it. Uh, the, you, what I see more often in pictures is actually a, um, a, side silhouette rendition of a boat that is pitching up and down which is maybe a little more intuitive than this and i guess it's really personal preference but um that's what you would typically see you'd see a round or more round gauge like u96 had more of a round gauge that had a or an oval like gauge that had a rendition of a u-boat on it that would tip so that the, they could easily see at a glance what their what their their angle was at that particular time Okay, but it's, it operates really on the same principle as this one. Uh, the other thing to note about these gauges is the, these valves here. 
you can see those very important because once you're below this depth 25 meters or once you're below 18 meters or whatever the case may be you shut them because you don't want the water pressure breaking these gauges you know these gauges are designed for lower pressure situations at, at shallow depths you shut those gauges when you go below those depths very very important as well um, so the steer the um, depth depth the dive plane steering boxes here they operate on the same principle as um, as the uh, as the the rudder control and everybody is sort of familiar with how these work it's a push button system it's electric uh, electric really by default and typically the electric motors were used the electric the electric drive of these were you was used because it was relatively quiet almost inaudible uh, but there was a way if the uh, if the uh, electrical system failed here with these with the steering there was a way to switch these to manual control and a manual con manual control was the use of the wheels that are around the boxes and there was a lever on the side of the control of the control box here they don't have it modeled but there is a lever here and a level here lever here to switch to manual and that would deactivate the electric the electric drive and unclutch these um, these wheels and then they were able to, to turn these wheels uh, and so and I think I mentioned in the power room video if they wanted to go back onto electric drive whether that's forward or aft they would actually have to walk up there and remove the deck plates and get down and flip a lever on the actual electric motor in order to switch it back on again again not a not a big deal because I mean you're only really switching to manual if, if the electrical transmission fails for whatever reason okay so that's the that's the 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 plane control under here you've got oxygen flasks there are four this there's a particular oxygen flask group there's four of these in the control room and they have these in the correct places um, oxygen again was part that's that's part of the air renewal system so you've got the scrubber unit here cleaning the air but then if a really prolonged dive uh, you've got um, you've certainly got measuring of, of, of the uh, co2 level of the air happening after four hours or so and then in the introduction of oxygen at some point to, to, to mitigate the the collection of CO2 in the, the or the concentration of CO2 in the air. So that that's strictly what those are used for. They're, these aren't compressed air tanks. These are um, these are oxygen tanks. Okay. So you've got those prominent, very prominent feature, of course, in the control room again is the is the NLSR. So that's Nacht Luft Ziel Zero in German. That's really your night and aerial search periscope. So this you, the Germans really they refer to this either as the centrale zero which is the control room periscope or the nacht zero the night scope because really what you're what you're looking at here is a, is a periscope that was that had much better light transmission than the than the um, attack periscope did uh, significantly so because the head was much bigger and so you've got um, you've got a, a a better means to shoot at night but again it wasn't the night it either had to be dawn or dusk or a really bright moonlit night otherwise this this also was relatively unusable not a big deal the u-boat was practically invisible on the surface at night you know what really flagged it was when the tower was above the horizon or if the tower were somehow spotted against the backdrop of the horizon which was pretty uncommon generally u-boats could get inside of convoys on a dark night and not be spotted a merchant ship would have to look down in order to see it and it just wasn't wasn't happening so but again if it was if it was a brighter night they would they would opt for this this again had um, it had a means to elevate it higher than the attack periscope in order to search the sky for planes it was very typical when coming up from depth to always level off at Paris do a sound check at 20 meters but then level off at periscope depth do a periscope, do a scope check of the sky and the horizon at both magnifications one one and a half and six were the historical magnifications. Check the surface before and then the blowing was initiated from periscope depth. But uh, they've done it. You know they've done a good job modeling this periscope. The color is not dark like this. It was actually white, and so and you'll see that in pictures. You know, but all the bells and whistles are on are are on here. You've got 
there are two colored glasses that are in this. There's an orange filter, and then there's like a, I believe there's like a grayish filter that, that you could apply. The magnification again was one and a half and six. When you look through the periscope, you would see this radical. This is this is indeed the historical one. Um, the the vertical scale is in one six. Each of those marks is one sixteenth of a degree, and then the horizontal marks are in degrees. Okay, so you, they've got they've made this change relatively recently, and they and they got it you know spot on. This is what the the view looked like. Up at the top, you would you would indeed also have the relative bearing projected like you see in the game. Um, you, but there was also a, a projection up there for the reciprocal of that bearing. So you would see, like I'm pointing at zero degrees relative now, under it you would see 180. So it showed the reciprocal bearing, and that was actually done by this here was the way for to flip the the bearing. Because what's happening here is you've got a ring up, you've got a bearing ring up here at the top, which they haven't modeled. Uh, but all it's doing is this prism back here is projecting that bearing ring on into the view. So you're seeing really just like a projection of it, like the, by prism. And so this was a, this, this thing tacked onto the back side of it here was to project also the back side of the periscope, which would show the reciprocal bearing. Now, if you're standing at this periscope and you looked up here, you would see a you would see two rings around. You'd see a bearing ring, a bearing ring at the bottom, and then you'd see a ring above it that went from 60 degrees red to 60 degrees green. Green being starboard, red being port. And what that was was in German they call it the Vorheitschieber. Vorheitschieber. That's the lead angle, um, like slider, lead angle slider. And it was for shooting with no without the TDC. It was for in, in a lot of instances, they would opt to not use the TDC if it was just a simple shot, or they could just line up a zero gyro and be done with it. They would use the Fohai Shiva, so they would have tables. The navigator would help the commander with tables, at lead angle tables. And in fact, the, ba the back of the real attack disc had lead angle tables on it. They could look at that, and based on the angle on bow and the target speed and the torpedo speed, they could just read off, cross-reference, and read off the lead angle. Uh, and then they would set the forehead shiba to that particular lead angle, and then that, when they lined up the, they could look up here and line the bearing up with that, with where they've set the shiba, the slider, and then they they knew that was the shoot bearing. So that was that was kind of how they did the no TDC shooting. We really need to have the shiba modeled up there for for no TDC shooting. Okay, so that's. That's the, the night scope. The attack periscope had also similar rings up there, and we'll talk about that when we get up to the when we do, in a different video when we get up to the conning tower. Uh, the one thing that's not in so okay, so I guess take, taking a further step back, there is a if you were to look at the real periscope, the tube of the scope, the, the sort of shiny silver tube that would go up here, you would actually see a there was an etched line all the way up the shaft of the periscope at zero degrees. Well, I really aligned with the front of the periscope. Like if it would be aligned with us if we were standing here right now. And what that's for is for calibrating the bearing ring. So the commander would say this this right this thing right up here is called the Schaltose, Shadow. You see that sometimes. This this device was actually for calibrating the um the bearing ring. They could they could decouple the bearing ring and then they could use this to a lot to make sure that the bearing uh, and I can't remember exactly how it worked, but it would it was a means by which they could align the that etched that etched line up the tube with zero degrees to make sure it was sort of the, the that the um, that the periscope was justiert in German was like aligned right and set appropriately and so um, so that's what that is. Well, what's missing up here is actually the and let me just. Yeah, they don't have it up here. Is the Tetsa uh, Geber? So there's a the t the uh, torpedo Tilrichtung Geber, which is the uh, the target bearing transmitter. And I'll let me sw I'll switch over here to picture and show you what that looked like. So here you can see here is the, uh, the the periscope in 995. This is not the historical periscope. They've got another mo like a post-war model in there right now. So just know that. Um, but the uh, Right up here, you see Tzeh Geber, 
uh, that is the target bearing transmitter. Each, and we'll cover this more, I guess, when we get into the control room, or excuse me, when we get into the conning tower and up to the bridge with the UZO. Uh, but each each set of optics had this trans had a transmitter like this, and what's in here is actually two two bearing dials like you would see on the TDC. They were like the, like the same manufacturer of dial that's that, that are hidden behind this covering, and what it's doing is it's 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 um, it's reading the bearing that's being that is um, that this periscope is being set to, and it's it's sending that bearing to the TDC. The German fire control system had the advantage of when it was told to do so, transmitting the bearing directly to the TDC from the optics as the as the like continuously. So it, as long as the and we'll we'll cover the follow switch here in a little while. As long as the follow switch were turned off or excuse me were turned on. Uh, you would have constant transmission of the bearing by way of this of this trans Gabe means transmitter by way of this transmitter uh, to the to a similar um, receiver that's in the TDC uh, that would and by way of a, like a synchro mode or like a Selsun link really it would compare those two readings and then the the TDC bearing motor would adjust uh, the bearing in the computer to match. Whatever GABA was selected by the by the control box, which we'll also cover in this video. Um, so many things in this submarine, but anyway, that's that's in there. It's it's small, but it's very important, uh, very important thing here. So that this is the one that's associated with the with the night periscope. All right. So switching back, we've got. Um, We've got so that the periscope again. I don't know if there's really much else to be said about it. Um, oh, I guess the other thing to be to say about it is, so Wolfpack's got it modeled where it's either all up or all down. This actually, this you could incrementally set this, and I would suggest that they change that. Um, you know, if if this was popped up and the commander would come in, they'd say, you know, bisschen runter, runter, bisschen runter. You know, he'd say you come down a little bit, down, down. Okay, fest, you know, or recht so, or something like that. Okay, it's good there. Um, you could incrementally raise it and lower. It wasn't just an all, all up or all down type of thing. So that'd be a suggestion I would have is to change that. Okay, so that's the that's the night scope. All right, let's move over here. Okay, so we've got up here. This box was not here. What you'd have up here is you'd have a set of eight. Uh, eight valves, and I, this is, since it's not modeled here, I'll need to switch over to a picture, and so let's go over to take a look at what those look like. Okay, so this is what you would see if you looked up here. What this is, is the exhaust blowing manifold. When, when a German submarine surfaced, they didn't blow the ballast tanks completely out right away. What happened was, when they were at periscope depth, they would they would, the part of the surface order was the order for unblasen, which is to begin blowing, start blowing the tanks. They would use high pressure air to blow the tanks enough so that the tower got out of the water. The chief engineer would say, boat is raus. The boat, boat is out. The commander would go topside, equalize the pressure, go topside, do a scan of the horizon, just him, with the binoculars to make sure everything is indeed clear. Boat is still running on electrics. Um, at that point, when everything was all clear and it was and he was safe on the surface, he would order Ausblasen mit Diesel. Ausblasen mit Diesel means blow the empty the ballast tanks with diesel. Diesel exhaust is what he's talking about. So in order to save on compressed air, and there was also the rumor, I guess, or I'm not sure if the Germans actually proved this to be true or not, but the the fatty gases from the diesel exhaust acted like a preservative to the interior of the ballast tanks. Whether or not that was true, the Norwegians were skeptical of that. And they were like, well, the Germans said this, but who knows if that's true. But at any rate, it was important because they could use, they're starting the diesels anyway, that the diesels were, were able to provide enough pressure to blow the, the remaining, it was lower pressure, but it would blow the remaining water out of the ballast tank. It took about 15 minutes to do that. This was not like, you know, all right, blow it out, boom, and here we go, off to the races. No, it, the, the, the blowing out process took about 15 minutes on the surface. It was actually quite long. But at any rate, we'll cover how this system worked when we get to the diesel room, but it, suffice it to say, the diesel mechanics would adjust the exhaust vents such they had a pressure gauge there. They would, exhaust, they would start one diesel, 
for one diesel was put online for blowing, one diesel was, and then the other um, diesel might be used for charging or whatever. But one diesel would, the, whatever the propulsion diesel was, would be put online, and that that would be used for blowing. And so they would adjust the pressure of the exhaust by way of the of manipulating the exhaust vents till they got the appropriate pressure, and then they would open a valve, and that would direct exhaust to this manifold here and then they would they would initiate the blowing process the, the, to, to empty the ballast tanks there was no gauge in inside the boat for contents of the ballast tanks that's purely a gameplay thing in Wolfpack what was done was the, the commander would watch the sides of the boat up front like the sides of the boat for uh, MBT3 and then the, the stern and forward uh, end of the boat the bow and the stern for um, MBTs five and one, and when he saw bubbles come up, he knew that the, the tanks were blown. Um, and then he would say, "Alle sind geblasen, alle haben geblasen, alle haben geblasen, all have blown, festblasen," which would be stop blowing, and then they would stop. Okay, so what is what here? So you've got, and this is actually intuitive. To the left is forward, and to the right is aft, because we're facing to starboard. We're sta facing starboard here. So pretty self-explanatory. This is this is to blow MBT five forward. This is to blow with exhaust to blow uh, MBT one aft. These two here are to blow. Um, this is to blow uh, MBT three port side, and this is to blow MBT three starboard side. This is for MBT four port side. This is for MBT port or MBT four port side and MBT four starboard side. MBT port. Two port side MBT, two starboard side, right? These are all your ballast tanks right here, and there's one for each of them for for diesel exhaust blowing. <clears throat> now there was an order in which they did this, uh, and it once I tell it to you, you'll sort of realize how intuitive it is. Ballast tank or MBT one was typically blown first, and that's that's so that you could have more weight forward if. If something happened and a destroyer came over the horizon or whatever, or an airplane came, you want to be more forward heavy than aft heavy. And so you would blow, you'd blow um, MBT-1 first, and then you would blow MBT-5 next, and then you would blow MBT-3 last. MBT-3 is large. MBT-3 is very large, and so you would... In order to maintain a lot of that weight in the boat, if you need to get down fast, you wait it to get do MBT threes until last. One, five, these. These again are typically filled with fuel. Um, <coughs> excuse me. To the extent they're using it as water ballast tanks, then you do those last. Okay. But again, these would typically not be touched because the controls would be locked if there were still fuel in them. Obviously, you're not blowing anything out with fuel still in it. So. So that is exhaust blowing. That is a very, very, very important element, aspect of the real boat is blowing with diesel exhaust. Almost never did they blow out with compressed air. It was almost always with diesel exhaust. And that's to save on precious compressed air. Uh, again, they could use the compressor to um, uh, to um, recharge the air. But, you know, if you're using the Junkers diesel compressor, you're burning diesel fuel by doing that and et cetera, et cetera. And so... Um, standard practice, blow a diesel exhaust. That's that's what that's all about. Okay, so going back to Wolfpack. So that's what you would see here if you're standing here at the blowing distributor. You'd go up, and then you'd manipulate those up here. Um, so you've got, and I'm in, actually we'll need to switch to a picture for this as well, because this, the, the, they've got all the, the valves here, they've got all correct, but, you know, because of, for gameplay reasons, you know, you've got much, much different functionality going on over here than you have in real life. Um, my hope is that at some point in time we figure out a solution, Wolfpack figures out a solution to bring the controls for the you know these respective things into their appropriate places. Totally a gameplay decision. If they do it, they do it. it would be great. If they don't, not a big deal either. But it would be nice to see things in their appropriate places in the control room. But you know you've got so you you've got your um, this is your your blowing distributor, this is your high pressure air distributor, and this is your low pressure air distributor. So starting with with the um, with the blowing distributor, you've got four gauges here in Wolfpack. These represent 
uh, like the contents of your ballast tanks uh, and like compressed air level. Let me switch over to a picture. I'll show you what this actually looked like in real life. So here you can see what you would see. Here's the main blowing wheel like you have in Wolfpack, but it, but you've got some different things here. You've got a you've got a high pressure air gauge here when you when you and I'll explain how these distributors work, but at any rate when you're when you're blowing the ballast tanks out, you're watching this to watch the how much pressure your high pressure air you're exerting or how much pressure you're exerting on your tanks. Uh, and then these four gauges here are actually differential pressure gauges for the uh, regulating tanks and bunkers. Right, so you do, the, we'll cover the regulating, regulating tanks and bunkers when we get to the after portion of the control room in the next video. But each, so there were two, two regulating tanks number two and two regulating tanks bunker tank bunkers number one, and these were the differential pressure gauges to show, um, to show the pressure inside the tank and then the outboard pressure, with the with the intent of making sure that the outboard pressure. Um, was the, or that the internal pressure was not above the outboard pressure because then you run, you run in the risk of uh, rupturing your tanks. So that's why these differential pressure gauges are existing here. Okay. Um, the R on here is regel regla or regel 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 zeller regel bunker. That's a regulator, right? Regulating tank. Okay. Uh, so that's what this that's what this really looked like in real life, and that's what these would be here. Um, and then this would be like an emergency gauge back here. But this is your main sort of high pressure gauge right here when you're blowing. You'd be you'd see that the, the, the um, control room mate who's operating this watching this. His eyes are glued to this to make sure he's exerting the right amount of pressure for blowing. All right. Okay, so back to the game. I can we can start talking about what these valves actually do. And so how this works in principle. Everything starts from here. Everything starts from your high pressure air distributor. In real life, there has a there was a big wheel up here, which was, um, which was the the valve for admitting high pressure air to the blowing manifold, and then also there was a um, there was a valve down here that admitted air to the low pressure air manifold by by way of a pressure reducing valve so there's a you obviously have to have a way to go from high pressure to low pressure air uh, but but suffice it to say everything starts from here and really everything starts from the high pressure air flasks of which there are several through the boat that feed this distributor here so the, the, the flow of air is I have high pressure air flasks that are filled from the compressors that high pressure air those high pressure air flasks are connected to the high pressure air distributor here and from here they go to, it goes to the blowing distributor the blowing manifold and then also through a pressure reducing valve to the low pressure manifold here the low pressure manifold low pressure air on the on the u boat you can, can think of as service air it's and we'll cover what all these valves do and the types of things that you would see but it's basically air that's needed for you know pneumatic devices or low pressure for moving things around in the boat like water for the torpedo compensating tanks etc. That doesn't need to be high pressure air. Okay, but everything comes from the high from everything starts as high pressure on the boat and then it's reduced to low pressure if the need be and it's directed to various things including the blowing manifold. Okay, so what what are these things then? You've got on the high pressure manifold. I'll just start from top to bottom. Again, you'd have a wheel up here, uh, and that wheel would lead to the blowing distributor. But in order to get, in order to direct that air from the high pressure air flask, these six valves here are all connected to high pressure air flasks one through six. Okay, so that's these here. So these would be open all the time. You always have that connection, and the and the, you know and, and you'd have this open as well up here, this wheel, so that you always had that that ability to blow at a moment's notice but you've got those connected there um, you've got number eight down he here on if you're looking at a schematic of this number eight down here is the um, um, that's for filling the high pressure air flasks from the top deck as your um, you obviously have to have a way to fill your starting point which is your high pressure air flasks that feed this distributor and so that's a connection for that um, to open that to be able to fill um, fill the high pressure air flask back through these again 
Um, you've got uh, the next one over here that I'm pointing to. Um, that's to the blowing manifold for the regulating tanks and bunkers, and those are actually down here. We'll cover those when we get to the when we get to this distributor over here. So that's what this is. Um, the next one we've got is um, these two down here. So these are actually to the um, to the the torpedo has the torpedo rooms have a high pressure air manifold. You've got I talked about this in the bow room. You've got temporary high pressure air canisters at each torpedo tube that need to be filled. And these are, um, these valves here, you need to have these open in order to be able to use those manifolds in order to fill those high pressure air canisters uh, in the torpedo rooms. So that's what those are. Um, number 12 down here is the valve that would be had, that would have to be open in order to, um, if you start the compressor, and are reloading your high pressure air. The air would come through here and then out these in and fill up the, the high pressure air flasks. Okay, so that's what that's what that would be doing. Um, you've got this one down here. This I talked about how air high pressure air flows through here and then flows to a pressure reducing valve in order to feed the um, low pressure air distributor. That's what this does here. This this actually this valve needs to be open in order for the high pressure air to flow through that pressure reducing valve and turn it into low pressure air to this manifold here. All right. Um, we've got the uh, the um, low pressure air manifold uh, is down here. So this actually goes to the. This is an additional valve that goes to the um, to the low pressure air manifold. There were actually two. Um, two uh, outlets from this distributor that actually flowed to that. And then the last thing down here is a drain valve. The last vent down here is a drain valve. So that's what that's where the what these do here. Um, let's go let's move to the blowing distributor. This is really kind of where the where the magic happens, I guess frequently because this is this is the point the, the place from which the blowing is actually initiated. Um, again, when the boat is at periscope depth and the order, it, the order comes to surface, unblasen, the, uh, the control room mate is, is turning this valve here and blowing. So how does that actually work then with, you know, vis-a-vis -vis the ballast tanks? Well, this, actually, this is actually a pretty simple distributor to understand. You've got, this would be closed all the time because you don't want to, again, this has a direct connection from the high pressure air distributor into this manifold here. So the air is coming up out of here down into here and then to the various ballast tanks through here okay through these lines here and out for these that they're, that these wheels are connected to so that's why this has to be closed right and so because you've got air pressure coming here exerting pressure on this here and so again very very actually very very intuitive again we're facing starboard so so to our left is forward to our right is aft Forward is MBT-5, that's this one. Aft is MBT-1, that's this one, Have the having these open. This next one is MBT-3 port, again intuitive, it's on the left side. And this is MBT-3 starboard, so having these open. And then you've got, the next one is your, um, your fuel ballast tank number 2 port, and number two starboard, and then number four, number four port, and four starboard. We are not touching these as long as we're in the fuel oil configuration. As long as we have fuel in the um, in the in fuel ballast tanks two and four, we are touching these. Otherwise, these would these would be open. So on a typical surface scenario, these would be closed. These would be open because you want to blow all ballast tanks at all ballast tanks that are in water configuration at once. So these would be open, one, three, and five, and then this would be turned, and the air would be coming from the HP high pressure air distributor down through here, through each one of these to blow out the ballast tanks until the chief engineer said, "Boat is raus, festblasen," which would be "Boat is out, stop blowing." This guy would stop, would turn this over again, 
you know, to close it again, and then the commander would already be up at the hatch, pop up there, make sure everything is copacetic, and then it would order the rest of the blowing to happen by way of diesel exhaust from up here. Okay, so this is really only touched in order to initiate the blowing to get the boat up, and that's it. All right. Okay, so then down here we have one set one manifold for the regulating bunkers and one manifold for the regulating tanks what the heck is the difference well the difference is not much but uh, the regulating bunkers are are smaller than the regulating tanks there's two of each there's a and I'll cover these in the aft control room section but there's regulating tanks two which are forward port and starboard and then there's regulating bunkers one port and starboard that are after those regulating bunkers are called bunkers because the Germans use the term bunker for a fuel carrying tank whether that's the diet Tauchbunker is the are the FBTs the fuel ballast tanks and the saddle tanks called Tauchbunker in German and then you've got the Regelbunker which are the regulating bunkers that were typically filled with fuel at the beginning so they'd have those filled with fuel as well one of those one of the set is for the regulating tanks which were always used as water regulating tanks and the other one was used for the regulating bunkers the principle is the same as up here you've got one for port one for starboard in this set blowing valve for it one for port this and this would be the bunkers cuz the, the 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 regulating tanks are forward of the bunkers here's regulating tank one regulating bunkers one again port starboard blowing blowing valve so that's your manifold for the regulating tanks to blow them out with high pressure air okay so that's that so that covers the blowing distributor that covers the um, high pressure air distributor let's talk about the low pressure service air uh, you would have a valve here it was not the negative tank control valve it was simply a uh, a valve connection from the high pressure air system but it was the did not go through the pressure reducing valve so typically this was kept closed and then you would have um, air flowing from uh, from this control or valve one of these valves down here up through the pressure reducing valve in order to create low pressure air but basically what you've got here is um, you've got this here this valve here is actually air is coming in through this from the pressure reducing valve so it's really this valve that's feeding the low pressure air into this manifold uh, you've got this valve here which actually feeds low pressure air to the um, foghorn the the, the u-boat had a foghorn that was in the front of the tower you see if you ever see pictures of the front of a type 7 counting tower there are holes in it two holes those are two foghorns the sizes are different pitches but but this that foghorn is blown with low, is sounded with low pressure air and that's what this one is right here um, next you've got um, these next two down here are the um, torpedo low pressure air manifolds forward and aft now why I thought we needed high pressure air for torpedoes like what are you telling me we need low pressure air for torpedoes well if you were paying close attention in the bow torpedo room video you'd remember that they use low pressure air to flood the torpedo tubes by pushing air into the torpedo compensating tanks which pushed water out of those tanks and into the torpedo tubes and then the reverse is the case they could select the lever that I talked about in the torpedo room and push the low pressure air into the torpedo tubes and then push the water out back into the compensating torpedo compensating tanks these are how that happened right here so these would be open really all the time so that in the bow room they could get that feed of low pressure air all right um, number six which is down here is actually there's a um, there is a um, excuse me let me get the pointer on there uh, there's a pneumatic tool connection and I can't remember exactly where it is in the boat it's in the control room but there's a to the extent they had any tools that operated on uh, by pneumatics so air pressure this was the the way that this was the valve that admitted air to that um, to that um, tool connection so that they could connect the tool and operate a, a pneumatic tool okay um, the uh, number seven which is here is is actually the low pressure air that is fed to the, the clutch for the forward and aft dive planes and then the next one down here is 
So number eight, if you're looking at a, at a schematic of this, that is uh, to blow the trim tanks. So the, the trim tanks are actually blown. Uh, and when I say blown, I, what I mean is they, there was, the, and I will cover this, we'll cover this extensively in the aft control room portion, but you could use the, to trim the boat and trimming means forward and aft, not like neutral buoyancy. Trimming is pitch of the boat. You've got your trim tanks forward and aft. You could either use the trim pump to direct water forward and aft between the two tanks, or you could use low pressure air, um, which was more common in like, especially in a battle stations type of situation, low pressure air is quieter than operating the trim tank. You could use this low pressure air from this, uh, and, and the controls of which are behind the scope well there, but you could use, this would feed that control back there in order to use low pressure air to, for trimming, to push water forward and aft. So that's what that is. Uh, number nine, this goes to uh, the compressed air gauge. So there's a gauge in the boat that would show the level of compressed air that feeds that. Uh, number 10 down here is the, um, this actually is, it's kind of a funny little thing. It's, it's the, it's to blow a seat connection for flooding, regulating tanks and distilling unit intakes. So when we cover, when we talk about the aft control room, you can barely see like right over here, there's a, um, there's a from sea valve that was used to flood the regulating tanks and also to admit water into the distilling unit, which is back there. There was a blow valve over there to like blow like seaweed or whatever other um, objects were in that water out before it was admitted into the tanks or into the distilling unit. That's That provided the air for that blowing feature to blow all that the foreign objects out of the out of that water. Uh, number 11 is, and so this here is the blowing for the, um, to raise the DF loop, the shaft, the shaft of which is, is actually here. So that's your DF loop, but the, that is raised by low pressure air. And that's, that's admitted from this portion of the distributor right here. Okay. And then below it, you'd see, you can't really see it here, but it's, um, a drain valve down here so that's that so that's your distributors that's that's you know Wolfpack has you doing you know you're effectively we're regulating tank work here which is achieving your neutral buoyancy that belongs back here that's all that functionality is actually in the aft control room this is your high pressure air distributor and then you've got your and I'm sure they're aware of that and again this is just strictly for gameplay but again maybe there's a solution to make it uh, more in line with history, I, I don't know. Uh, and then this wouldn't be your negative here. This would be your your low pressure air distributor um, there. But but while we're here, let's actually talk about what the starboard negative tank controls look like. Because again, there's a starboard negative tank and a port negative tank, and each has their own set of controls. So for this, since it's not modeled here, I will, I'll need to switch over to a picture. So let's take a look at what the starboard negative tank controls look like. Okay, so here we go. Here we see in 995, these are the starboard negative tank controls. You've got a few different things here. You've got your flood valve here, the big one. You've got your hull valve here. And then you've got your common blowing valve here. Both negative tanks were blown with a common blowing valve. And then you've got your differential pressure gauge up here. So the way this is typically operated is you'd have, again, you've got one port and one star, but we'll cover the other side, which is somewhat mirrored. We'll cover the other side uh, here shortly. But basically, the way this worked is, you know, the negative tanks generally stay flooded on the surface, which is why Wolfpack changed it to be that way, because the whole purpose of the negative tank is for dive readiness and to get under the water to break the, the surface film of the water quickly and then blown at anywhere from 8 to 12 meters so that you didn't use more compressed air than necessary when you got deeper in order to act against the pressure that's being exerted on the hull. So staying flooded on the surface, blown at 8 to 12 meters. Okay. And so what would that look like? You would have, when you're operating on the surface, your flood valve would be closed, your hull valve would be closed, this tank would be full of water. Both of these tanks would be full of water. Um, you've got on the dive order, you've got, um, these 
these stay closed. Excuse me. These these become open. The flood valve gets open. The hull valve gets opened. The guy is gripping this common blowing valve, waiting for the order. Ausdrücken. Ausdrücken means to like expunge, expel water. Ausdrücken again. It's different than ausblasen. Ausdrücken is the the term that was specifically used for the neg and understood to mean the negative tanks. And Ausdrücken when that was when that was ordered, you know, both of these, this hull, this flood valve and this hull valve would be open on this side, and the the same ones for the port side would be open, and you would you the guy on this side would um would turn this common blowing valve and blow those tanks out again all the time he's watching this differential pressure gauge to make sure that that internal pressure of the tanks didn't exceed the external pressure okay and if he did he'd bleed the you know bleed air out of it but um at any rate the common blowing valve was here right so h12 meters we're blowing this thing stop it's it's empty we shut the we shut the compressed air off we shut Flood valve, we shut hull valve. We are now now it's um, full of air. Okay, and then again, the really the reverse is happening. I guess we'll talk about when we get to the other side. We'll talk about the surfacing aspect because your common venting valve, in other words, the way to get water back into the tank, is on the other side. So we'll talk about that actually when we um, when we get over to that other side. But these are the negative tank. These are the starboard negative tank controls here. Okay. So let's go back to the game. All right. Since we're already on this side of the boat and we're taking a look at this, this is going to be my the cutoff in terms of uh, how far aft I go. But basically you've got uh, this here. Often People often wonder what this was. This is auxiliary switchboard number two. Again, it's connected to the to the main switchboards that are in the e motor room. Uh, this can be this switchboard can either be fed directly from the battery, excuse me, or it can be fed from the main switchboards. What this can, what this powered was pretty much all starboard lighting, all lighting on the starboard side of the boat. The order system, which is the order transmission system, which we'll actually cover. Uh, I should have covered it earlier but it's further up there we'll talk about it I guess a little in a little bit uh, it powers that order transmission system so that's your telephones um, your you see your power telephones that you've seen Wolfpack now loudspeakers etc it powers that it powers all it, it provides all starboard power to any electrical equipment that's on the starboard side here uh, and then it also provides power to the two pumps that are in the control room so yeah that's your that's your your um, drain your bilge and drain pump and then your um, trim pump okay so that's the auxiliary switchboard two uh, you've got a and I guess since I since I talked about the order system let me just cover that really quickly because otherwise I'm gonna forget it so up here this does not look like the real box the real box had six switches on it but this would be the switch box or the um, the fuse box for the order transmission system and the order transmission system powered things like your tachometers, your um, it powered your um, like your rudder indicator, it powered your loudspeakers, it powered all those different types of things. But this is the fuse box for that here. Okay. Uh, the DF loop shaft is here. I talked about that already, but that's your direction finding loop that extends and retracts up the bridge, the big ring up there for um, for measuring or for um, obtaining bearings the bearing of uh, bearing signals of, of transmissions on a particular frequency that's what that's that's what that loop shaft is there uh, back to here these here are again this is also something that people always notice in the boat there actually were three of these they've only modeled two but there are, should be three of these large tanks back here these are not air tanks these are actually hydraulic accumulators these are these are accumulating oil because these I'll cover these in the app but these are your hydraulic pumps right here and this these are the your oil like your pressurized oil tanks for powering hydraulic the trope that's primarily your periscopes or your two periscopes are controlled hydraulically uh, and these are the accumulators for that uh, and then later later when snorkel was implemented that was also powered hydraulically um, and so that's these are your accumulator tanks for those your oil accumulation tanks for 
basically pushing your oil to power your your hydraulics. Um, that's what that is. The oil for the the oil for the hydraulics was actually behind the distributors here, and I, this this you see jutting out here is actually that. So you can see this big, you can see this box like object back here. That's actually your hydraulic oil tank. So all your hydraulic oil is actually back here. Okay, so that's your hydraulic oil there. Uh, the dive ready lamps and compartment the compartment ready and and uh, Outboard hull valve lamps are here, so these feature prominently. People always notice these. Uh, it's you see these in you know renditions of of the submarine pretty frequently. Uh, the chief they were placed here so that the chief engineer who's sitting standing here, who is responsible for the dive and uh, safety of the dive, can just glance over and see. And these would be actually lower because as you can see right now, me as the chief engineer, I can't actually see the top board, which is problematic so these would be down a little lower okay but at any rate your top ones are your hull valves these are they're actually a u9 or u995 has six of these a piece the real boards actually had really only had five lights the 995 has an additional light for elements of the snorkel system that most boats didn't have so but the top are your hull valve so you've got really five and there are electrical um little contacts that are attached to each one of these wheels f throughout the boat and we'll cover these in later videos because none of them are up here in the forward part of the control room to show you but um, there were there were electrical contacts on those to the extent that that when that wheel was shut it would send a signal to this board to light up to say hey, this you know this hull valve is secure and ready for dive so there are five of them you've got your external exhaust ports external excuse me your external exhaust vents port and starboard you've got your diesel air air intake head valve so that's three and then you've four and five are your ventilation intake and and exhaust head valves so we'll cover where all of those are uh, in future videos some of those are actually in the control room right aft right right behind our periscope well here but at any rate those are the head valves those have to be closed most of those, all of those, in fact, head valves have also foot valves in the boat, but that's just a function of redundancy, right? You've got a head valve and a foot valve. Both of them protect the boat's pressure hull from taking on water, but the important thing is, is those head valves are closed so that, say, the diesel air intake exhaust, or excuse me, diesel air intake trunk that's above our heads, or that would be above our heads if we were in the aft portion of the boat, doesn't fill up with water. Your foot valve is closed, so no water is getting in the diesel room. But your head valve is open, so that diesel, that huge diesel air intake trunk that's under the top deck is full of water. It happened in 995, and the chief engineer of 995, the, the Norwegian chief engineer of 995, described having real trouble when they realized they had a, I don't know if it was because of a leak or whatever in their head valve, and all of a sudden they had a full diesel air intake trunk, and they're having trouble arresting the dive. You know, in a peacetime situation with Norway after the war in the 1950s, and here they're worried about, you know, arresting that dive. You know, it's submarine is submarining is certainly dangerous work. But at any rate, that's what you've got there. Is you've got five hull openings that need to be secure. The bottom one are the dive ready lamps, and I touched on two of them in my two previous videos. These are the switches that are located throughout the boat that say. My compartment is ready, is tokla, is ready for dive. All the things that need to be shut are shut and secure and tied down and we're good. And so what those would be would be you'd have one, there's one switch at the, at the e-motor room had a desk similar to this one. The e-motor room had a desk back there so the e-motor mate could select his switch at the desk and say my compartment is good. Um, you'd have one in the diesel room at similar. There was a desk in the diesel room uh, where the diesel mate could select it and say, yep, my, the diesel room is clear for dive. The petty officer's quarters, which is, we'll get to that in a future video, that's just after the control room had one as well. We talked about where the one in the chief petty officer's quarters was. Um, that was above the uh, provisions hatch up there. And then there's one in the bow room. Okay, so those are your lamps for that. Very important. 
Next, we've got the control room mate's desk. He's just got a standing desk right here, and what he would be doing here is, in in this, he would be storing the dive logbook, Tauk Tagabu. The dive logbook was very important. The dive logbook was the foundation for the trim dive every day. So it was basically a roll forward calculation that he would provide. He would perform in this book. Um, it looked like a ledger book. It looked like something an accountant would use but it was basically saying here was my starting point here were the here are the entries for all of the measurements of all water bearing tanks in the boat which were which were measured by dipstick every trim dive that's called pylon the germans call it pylon pylon means to like sound or do a dip like a do a dipstick type and measure the uh contents of a tank pylon so the clouds and pylon so they'd say that, and then they'd get ready, ready to take the measurements of water, and they they would measure all the water bearing tanks in the boat, with the exception of the ballast tanks, of course, those are full. Uh, and then they would, this is while they're at periscope depth and they're trimming the boat out, they would, the control room mate would enter all of those readings into his book right then and there, and then would would ultimately um, determine how well they maintained the contents of the regulating tanks while they were on the surface. And we'll cover the regulating tanks in more detail again in the next video, but basically um, the control room mate would be keeping tabs on, or at least the, the heads of the different com kind of compartments or whatever would be communicating to the control room mate all the weight changes, the estimated weight changes that they think have happened in their areas. And the, the control room mate would then go aft and, and then a, and actually admit that much weight of in water into the regulating tanks to make up for that lost weight, whether it's provisions or certainly fuel and, and things of that nature. Well, I guess fuel is less so because water is heavier than fuel. But So to a certain extent for fuel and certainly for provisions and other items, he would have to go back here, and I'll show you how that worked in a few in a, later video but admit some water into the regulating tanks to offset that weight and he would he uses his dive log book to keep track of all that stuff so such that when the trim dive happens every day there is minimal amount of weight shifting that has to be happening in order to trim out the boat uh, and of course the ultimate purpose of that is to make sure if you were in a combat situation and you had to crash dive now you don't want to be fumbling around with trim and balance while you've got the enemy coursing over you and dropping depth charges. Uh, you certainly don't want to be doing that. You want the boat to be in trim, ready trim all the time. Hence the daily trim dive. Hence the dive logbook. So that's really what that's what he's doing here. In das Boot, you see, uh, they have Frenzen be the control room mate in das Boot. In, in the in the novel, he was actually a diesel mate, but. So Frenzen was a control room mate in the Centrale Mart in the movie. You see him standing at this desk writing in a book. He's writing in the dialogue book. Okay, and that's what he's doing there. So that's the control room mate's desk. Uh, below him, you've got a the auto. This is an automatic starter for the main hydraulic pump, which is here. Uh, or it might be this one. I can't quite remember. But at any rate, one is main, one is auxiliary. That's the auto, it's an automatic starter for that. Okay, uh, and then of course you've got your ladder up to the conning tower. Uh, there's no ex further explanation needed besides the fact that I mean, if you can picture um, the uh, uh, Wolfpack has made it the the tower considerably larger inside than it really was, and this ladder would be actually just a straight shot down. You, there would be no walking. There'd be no going up and then walking a step or two to the next ladder. This would be just a straight shot down. One ladder leads to the next because what's happening on a crash dive is you've got guys literally jumping, jumping through that hatch and hitting the floor down here. And then there would be you'd have a guy posted up here yanking the guy away such that so that he didn't get the 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 boots of the next guy down on his head or his shoulders. Jumping, okay. Uh and then the, the whoever the watch officer was or the commander or whoever would be dangling from that wheel up there, shutting the hatch with his feet dangling. I mean, that's how fast this went. But but at any rate, the ladder went straight down. There was no lip there. There was no walking a step or two and then going up to the next one. It went straight down. Um, 
down here you've got um, the, these switches, the night light. Well, we'll talk about the lighting, I guess, in a little bit. But that wasn't. Don't believe that was here. The alarm there was no alarm bell here, to my knowledge. And this phone was actually up here, up here. But probably for ease of use, they put it down here. Okay. Down here, you've got drain valves for the tower into the bilge. So the other thing to mention here, and I actually didn't mention this up in front here. The other thing you've got below the decks is the bilge. Self-explanatory, but you've got all your <laughs> wastewater that's coming down, you know, from from certainly from the tower. The hatches were always open in the tower, so you've got water coming down here into the bilge. Bilge pump being run to drain that out, right? But the bilge is down there, and it's you. It was very common to hear water sloshing back and forth in the bilge. Okay, but these are these here are are valves to drain the tower. If the tower is full or has water in it, you could open these to drain the contents of the tower into the bilge. All right, we talked about the phone already. Uh, the chart table. Really pretty self-explanatory here. The real one actually had a celluloid plate, a clear plate that you could that would come down over this, and you the navigator could lift it up with one hand and make his notes on the paper inside, and not have to worry about getting the paper and uh, putting that celluloid plate back down again, which is clear, transparent, and didn't have to worry about following up his his charts with water. Okay. But yeah, the chart table again. You know, you, the navigator is doing all of his, navi his his navigation work here. He has, you know, a cupboard over here for book. This is same in the same thing in the real boat. Case for his sextant over here. All of this is main, maintained here. Down here, also in the in the vicinity, you would also have hooks for hanging the um, binoculars for the bridge watch. The binoculars were shared, and they were used by every bridge watch each man didn't have his own binos it was but those would be hung here and dried here okay in this vicinity um, you've got above the chart table you've got some things in here that Wolfpack has put here for gameplay purposes that really weren't here there was a compass that was more here the depth this depth gauge wasn't here really the compass was more here and then you know you'd have one thing, you, the, the what was here in this spot here where this compass is was actually the main switch box for the fire control, powering the fire control system, which we'll cover in a little bit. Uh, that was here. Um, the U995 has some gauges up here and some handles that are associated with the hydraulic system for the snorkels, which most boats didn't have. Uh, these over here, at least a couple of these valves here, just for the sake of interest, are actually um, valves for... Uh, for the that allow water in the header tank to so fuel was moved around the boat to the various to to the to the diesel room gravity tank by way of water pressure and so that's what these these are um, these valves here are actually connected to uh, fuel ballast tank number four and they need to be open so that when water is coming down from the header tank and into fuel ballast tank number four, down way down below the water comes in, it pushes, that's water pressure, that pushes fuel out through these pipes and into, there is a valve selection chest for fuel in the diesel room and they could actually select um, the source of their fuel in order to put it into the gravity tank to get it into diesels but the, the, that's what these are is to actually you need to have these open in order to even get fuel out of the tank into the gravity tank in the diesel room okay so that's what that's what that is for, for fuel ballast tank number four um, we can talk about the we, let's talk about the port negative controls because there's also another piece that I'd like to talk about with that but for that again I need the I need a, a picture help because those controls aren't represented here uh, so let's take a look at what that looks like. Okay, so we've got the port negative tank controls, and we've got another little bonus item in this picture as well. Uh, so similar controls to what we saw in the previous, uh, on the starboard side negative tank, you've got your flood valve for your, for your port side negative tank, you've got your hull valve, and then you've also got a common venting valve down here. So whereas we had on the on the starboard side, we had a common blowing valve that that applied to both 
sides. Here we've got the common venting valve that applies to both sides. Okay, and then you've also got a drain valve here to tell when your when your tanks are actually are actually um, full. So you can um, so we talked about the diving aspect on the other side. Let's talk about the surfacing aspect, which in this case means the flooding of these, because again we're keeping these negative tanks full on the surface so therefore when we're coming up from periscope depth to the surface we need to flood them again so that if Mr. Destroyer or Mr. Airplane is up there we got them flooded and we're ready to get back down again okay so let's cover the coming from periscope depth up the order is given from periscope depth anblasen, anblasen, auftauchen, anblasen um, you've got uh, you you you're now blowing you're coming up the boat boat steigt boat you know the, the boat is rising you're opening your flood valve you're opening your hull valve okay and then you're opening your common venting valve and what's happening there is since the, since the flood valve is open and the hull valve is open once you open the venting valve water can now stream back into the negative tanks and where does the air go the air go the air is vented through a muffler that's down at your knees down here or at your shins you would feel a rush of air coming in. That's because the that the the water that's coming into the negative tanks is pushing the air actually into the pressure hull. On a dive, you almost always have an overpressure situation because you've got various things various things that are pushing air into the pressure hull, whether that's your torpedo firing, all the high pressure air that's in the torpedo tube after you've pushed the torpedo out that gets vented into the pressure hull. You've got you know, and then you've got your negative tanks, which the contents of which, the air contents of which get vented into the pressure hull, right? So these are things that are creating overpressure that needs to get bled off when you surface, okay? But at any rate, this is the vent, the common venting. And so you'd have that open, you fill up your, you know, you'd fill it up and then you could, they could tell when it was full. I believe that's what this little funnel is for, is they could, this check, little check valve, would, when water came out of there, they knew that they were full and then they could shut all the valves again and their negative tanks were were full again okay and again this differential pressure gauge is very important here is because you don't want your internal tank pressure to be higher than your external tank and so you then you need to be you need to be um, venting a little bit to relieve the pressure okay so that's what that is all about um, that's the port negative tank controls the, the bonus that I mentioned here and I I don't. I can, didn't find a better picture of it. I'm sure I, I could have, but it, it's not. It's not a very exciting looking box. But this gray box back here is actually part of the fire control system, and that's what's in German is called the Zeitschalter. Zeitschalter is like a time switch, and it's for it's for shooting fans spreads. The way the Germans spread the German spread worked was very different than the American spread. Whereas the Americans would fire each torpedo individually, what happened with the Germans was they had a system by which if they set the, the correct setting on the fire control switch boxes, which I'll cover in a minute, um, this, in if you lifted the plate off of this box, you would see a set of, of timing cams that are set to certain intervals, and that interval was about 2.3 seconds. And when the magnetic trigger was, when the electric firing lever was pulled and triggered that magnetic trigger, it triggered this, um, these cams to start ticking and the cams would start turning and at every two every every 2.3 seconds the fire the magnetic trigger would get triggered again and then again and then again for however many shots were intended for the fan so whether that was a, a fan of two a fan of three or a fan of four after that particular interval it was and it was an ingenious system of cams like I said that would turn at a, at a particular rate and when those cams turned enough, it would trigger the next shot, and then the next shot, and then the next shot, and it was and it was structured in such a way that the shooter only had to pull the lever once, and he could let it go again, and then that time switch would shoot those torpedoes at the preset interval. The standard was 2.3 seconds. Later in the war, it was changed by order of, from Dönitz uh, to eight seconds because of because magnetic uh, the magnetic detonators were. Uh, the torpedoes were interfering with each other, uh, and, and interfering with the with the magnetic setting of the pistols. Um, 
being so close together. And so eight seconds was later in the war, but it was typically set for 2.3 seconds. So fire, shoot, boom, boom, next torpedo would go out all on its own. It was not like pull the lever again, pull the lever again. It was the side shot of this box made it so that you pull the lever once and every and every shot will go out every 2.3 seconds, okay? It's very important, but very inconspicuous here. That's what that is, okay? All right, so let's take a look back in, in, in Wolfpack here. Um, let's see here. Actually, let's not look at Wolfpack. Let's look back at another picture because there's actually another, there's some other elements that I actually want to talk about that are not modeled in Wolfpack. Um, okay, so let's take a look here. We've got uh, up here on the left, we've got the Blauschalter. This is the blue switch. So I mentioned before the, uh, the, the target bearing transmitter which was here, okay? So in order to activate this, well, not to activate this, this would be always active, but in order to complete the transmission of the bearing from this device to the TDC, that was facilitated by way of this blue switch. And this blue switch in the control room was the switch associated with the night periscope. There was also a blue switch that was built into the TDC. It was a lever on the bottom right side of the TDC that did this for the attack periscope and the UZO. Um, and what this did was this controlled the bearing motor in the TDC. It either activated the bearing motor or it cut the power to the bearing motor. And if the bearing motor, if the power to the bearing motor in the TDC was cut, the TDC no longer followed the bearing in the optics. As soon as that blue switch was switched again, the bearing would then resynchronize, and the computer would then resynchronize to the optics by way of an error signal that the comparator inside the TDC would um, would receive, and that would trigger the motor to start, and the uh, the bearing dials in the computer would then realign with whatever the uh, bearing transmitter from the particular optics was sending. And it was called the blue switch because when the bearing was when the bearing motor was deactivated, the light would be blue here. This little circle here was a light. When that shone blue, that meant that the bearing was not being transmitted to the TDC, or the bearing was not being updated in the TDC. Why would that be important? It's because if the commander needed to take a look around, like a 360 degree look around with his optics. He does not want that bearing to be slewing around in the TDC because that means the gyro angle spindles are also following along in the torpedo rooms, or at least in the bow torpedo room, which is automatic. And that that could cause problems in the torpedo. A torpedo is a very delicate piece of equipment, and the gyroscope is certainly delicate. You do not want the gyro spindles to be turning willy-nilly uh, as you turn the periscope because if the bearing, the way the TDC works, if the bearing changes... The gyro, the gyro angle changes, and since the gyro angle transmission in, the, in a U-boat fire control system was automatic from the TDC to the gyro angle receiver and therefore to the gyro spindles, um, you're turning the gyro, you're turning the gyroscope, the gyro angle in the gyroscopes every time you turn the bearing. <laughs> so it was very important to say that what the commander would do is he would say "blau nicht folgen," which means "blue don't follow." If he needed to take a look around or the the um, the uh, regulations stated basically anytime you take the optics off the target you order blue and that and then as soon as you get back on the target you order um, blau aus which would be blue off which basically means I want the bearing to follow again okay so that's what the blue switch is all about you you want you don't want that bearing slewing around in the computer because that's going to be slewing the gyro angle around and the gyro, when you're talking about gyro angles and torpedoes, you're talking about very delicate pieces of equipment. Okay, so that's what this is for, is to decouple the bearing motor and the TDC so that you're not spinning the gyro angles around. Okay, so that's blue light, very important, very important. Okay, this big bad boy here is also very important. This is the main switch box for the fire control system. This is how you turn the fire control system on. The fire control system ran on a 110 volt 
uh, excuse me, the fire control system ran on 55 volt AC power, but the converters there were there were there was a fire control converter and then there was another converter uh, to for the gyro angle setting gear. Those ran on 110 volt power and converted that power to 55 volt AC power. So what happened? What would happen is is you would turn this switch on here to, to power the uh, the converters to provide power to the to the um, to the to the um, DC to AC converters in the aft torpedo room, which is where the converters were. And then you would switch on the there was a switch here to start the converter motors. So you would cycle this switch, and this, unfortunately the faceplate of this is missing. You would cycle it to the first one, which would start uh, which would start one converter. And then you'd cycle it to the next one, which would start the next converter. And then both, when both converters were running, and when I say both, I mean one is for the fire converter to convert uh, current for the fire con powering the fire control system itself, and then the other one is for the gyro angle setting gear. Two of them, and so they would both be running here. And then you say, okay, I've got I've got my voltage. I need to be at 55 volts AC. That's red here. There's a there's a you can barely see the voltmeter in here. It's got a, a line at 55 volts. This this is Norwegian here, but in German you'd say Spannungsregler, which is similar, I guess, to Norwegian. Um, you've got a way to regulate that voltage if it's out of line with 55 volts. That's what this is. And then you would say, okay, I have my offsetting up here, and then you would switch this switch over to here which would be turning the fire control system on. That's your final step. You say, click, I'm turning the fire control system on. When I say click, whoever's up in the, in the tower would see the TDC lights light up. Whoever, uh, is, that's what you would see. And then actually, I forgot to mention this already, the 110 volts actually powers the torpedo launching system as well, which is your firing levers of which there are two. There's one on the bridge at the UZO column, and there's one in the tower by the TDC. Provides power to those, and it provides power to your Lampentafel, which are the lamp boards. There's one in the tower that shows five torpedo ready lights. Not ready lights. They're not ready lights at all. Torpedo lights. They light, the, all five are lit up to show I have selected X number of tubes. And then there's one in the bow room for four tubes, and then there's one in the stern room for the yeah, aft tube. All right, those light up when that when the switch box is selected, which I'll cover in a minute. But um, the 110 volt switch powers that as well. So when you switch this over, you'd see the TDC light up. You get power to that, and it also, if you went forward into the gyro, to the forward gyro angle receiver, which we covered already, on the bow room, you would see the lights light up on that as well. Okay. Uh, and then you would have a, the setting over here was actually for the for the um, searchlight system. That was actually powered from the fire control converters as well. Oddly enough, it's total, totally counterintuitive. It took us forever, took me forever, to figure out what this other side was. And it's sure enough, when I looked at it closely in, in different pictures of the fire control system, it's like, ah, that's the Scheinwerferanlage. That's the... That's the uh, spotlight system, searchlight system. Okay, so that's that would be if you wanted to switch that on, you'd switch it over to that side. This is the so this is the this is the uh, main switch box for the fire control system, and incidentally also the uh, the searchlight system. Okay, also very important. I'm only covering the important things, and so uh, we talked about that. Okay, so then we can go back into the game. And we can talk about um, the. Let's talk about the switch boxes. Two switch boxes down here that are very important to the fire control system. Uh, Wolfpack incorporates all this functionality into the TDC. But what you had down here is you had you had your left-hand box was your torpedo director switch box, and the one on the right was the torpedo launching switch box. And what do these do? The the torpedo director switch box, the the left the leftmost switch. Um, designated uh, which um, optics you were firing from, so you you could either select and and not opt. Really, what you're selecting is you're selecting the the gay bar, the thing that I pointed out that was above the periscope up here. 
the GABO, so the transmitter. You're selecting what transmitter is active. I either want the transmitter that's associated with the UZO, op, the UZO or the night scope or the attack periscope. I had to switch setting for each one of those. Activate this. This is angle tracking. In, in, um, uh, this in conjunction with the blue switch that was up here is really what angle tracking is doing in Wolfpack. Saying from, I want from bearings from this optic, these set of optics. Okay, so that's what this is doing. This one here is the selection for which gyro angle receiver I want to be active. I want either the bow, the one in the bow room, the gyro, forward gyro angle receiver to be active, or the aft one. Okay, so that's that's this switch. So that's your torpedo director switch box. Your torpedo launching switch box has three switches. One, the first one is for uh, to select either a single shot or a fan shot and there were two fan settings there's either there's a single shot um, for each tube okay one two three four or five and then there was a setting for um, fan while turning or fan on a straight course and I will not in this video I will not get around to the to describe the distinction between those two but at any rate suffice it to say you had two fan settings on here and then you had ones for single shot. The one in the middle was for assuming you selected a fan shot on the first switch, you would say, I want, what does my fan look like? There were multiple different combinations of fans you could shoot, combinations of tubes you could shoot. All four, you know, one in three, two in three, two, three, and four, all many different combinations you had. And that was selected here. The last one is actually the firing lever switch. What firing lever do I want to be active? You had two options. You had the UZO. There was a firing, an electric firing lever on the column itself, or you had the one in the tower interior, which was used for submerged shooting, which was right by the TDC. Okay, so that's what these boxes are doing. Fire control system is my sp specialty. I know, I know the system, at least this Type Seven C system, inside and out. And so if anybody has any questions about any of the components of fire control, I am your guy. Okay, so that is, those are the torpedo director and launching switch boxes. A man would be down here selecting these at battle stations. And he'd also be controlling the control box that I showed you, that, which was here. Okay. Um, the, so moving along the side, back along the port side of the boat here, this here is the winch motor. This big device here is the winch motor for the night periscope. Again, you've got they've got the lever here for raising and lowering the periscope in the correct place. Again, I would only suggest that they change this to be incremental instead of all all in or all out uh, because you could adjust that in real life. It's hydraulics. I mean, you can just up or down, up. You know, you're just adjusting really the the hydraulic pressure that's exerting on the periscope. Um, and then you've got also here is the ratchet for if 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 this motor you know craps the bed and you need to be raising the periscope by hand you would slap a big old ratchet onto here and crank that baby up that's the ratchet for raising and lowering the periscope by hand uh, it was not in the middle of the chart table it was actually to the right of the chart table um, the chart table in real life went from here only to about here they've got it much much larger than it was in real life okay so that's that uh, the we talked about this in the previous video this in u995 is actually part of the fumo 30 equipment that's radar equipment that is obviously very late war a very late war thing what was here or what what this space was designed for in the original design of a type 7c was to accommodate active sonar gear escalate okay uh, so that, but, but it once when when they disposed with the whole escalate concept, because commanders were hesitant of, about using it with good reason, this became a tailor-made spot to put the radar, and so that's why you see in U995 you see a radar unit here. Uh, it actually would be also here. The not the um, the Fumo 30 had had a had multiple units to it that was here and then there was also an, a neighboring unit that would have been stamped that would have been installed here uh, and so you would, have, you would have seen that here as well uh, and then the 
Uh, the last thing that I'll point out down here is this. This is actually the, the fuse box for the fire control system. That's what that is there. Okay, so all that being said, that is all of the technical aspects of the boat that I'm going to cover in just the forward part of the control room. It's a lot, but there's a couple more things that I kind of want to touch on, and one of which is lighting. The Type 7 did not have red light. The, uh, if they needed at night, what, the, what was typically done is the control room lights were completely turned off, and if anybody was in any other part of the boat that had to go on bridge watch, and these would be primarily the men in the bow room and also in the forward battery areas up here, uh, your your those would be your uh, the lords as they called them, the basic seamen that stood the bridge watch, the petty officers. Well, I guess a couple of those petty officers would be back in the petty officers' quarters as well, but um, they would be wearing red goggles as you see in dust boat to a to acclimate their eyes to the darkness, but there was, but the, the Type 7C did not have red lights in it. It was not; it's nowhere to be found in documentation, um, and even Buchheim uh, doesn't describe red light in Das Boot. Um, and even actually, when when he was asked about the different colored lights in the boat that are seen in the movie, his comment was. Yeah, those didn't really exist, but what do I care? It's Hollywood, or not Hollywood, but anyway, you know, it's it's the movie industry. Um, they can do what they want. It makes for a, an interesting um, movie when they have features like that. Okay, so he was he acquiesced to it, uh, but he did acknowledge that you know that type of lighting, the blue light that you see in Das Boot, there were actually some blue coverings for some lights in sleeping areas in the Type Seven very low light situation, uh, low, uh, low light type of low wattage bulbs, not the glaring blue light that you see in dust boat for battle stations and certainly not uh, the, the, the blue light that you see in like the game U-Boat, for example, which denotes like a silent running type situation. Blue light was in, was the Type 7C was designed with blue light fixture coverings in, or like bulbs effectively coverings in sleeping areas and that's about it but again no red light in the real boat a at night the control room was completely darkened um, and and that's of course to make sure and the same thing with the tower and that's of course to make sure that you know nothing is glowing up out of the hatch including red light would be completely visible and the, the hatch is always open even at night the control room was just darkened okay and that's and I'm sure it was the same way on a type 9 no red lights in the boat that's just not um, not not the reality of the situation. Okay, so might become as a surprise to people, but that's that's the reality. And so, um, and so I guess it probably makes sense at this point to talk about who would be here in a typical situation, like a typical surface situation, typical di di submerged situation, and then maybe a typical battle station situation. So during typical submerged travel, you 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 would you would see the control room mate would always be in here and he'd have one centrale gust centrale gust is like your, his control room assistant would be in here the control room mate would be found here typically writing at his at his podium and then in the aft part of the control room would be his centrale gust would be hanging out here and I'll cover what we'll cover what he did uh, in the next video but that's that would be your your permanent sort of control room personnel and each one of those guys stood a six hour watch okay six hour watch six on six off because they were part of the technical branch they were not seen they were not part of the Siemens branch they were technical personnel they were also incidentally called or at least the, the centrale gust the control room assistant was actually incidentally sometimes called the centrale heitza heitza was a stoker well he's not stoking anything up here in the engines but he's since he's part of the technical division they, he gets the name heitza okay and so he's helping the control room mate with things here. Uh, the you, the navigator might be here doing his navigation, uh, but that's typically it. You wouldn't really see very many uh, people would be coming through, coming and going on the surface through here for various reasons. But you know, in terms of who's manning the station up here, it's typically the, the centrale mate, the so control room mate, and his centrale gust. And then the navigator might be up here doing his little sketching or whatever you know is navigational work up here okay so that's a typical surface situation um, on a, during a routine dive you would have the bridge watch coming down here and assuming this is a wartime situation 
and you're not doing peacetime diving stations, a typical wartime, you'd have um, your bridge, your, the two men from your, or excuse me, the, um, the whatever the bosun's mate, whoever the bosun's mate was that was on bridge watch would take, would man the forward dive planes. And then one man, one basic seaman from the bridge watch would man the aft planes. And the, the chief engineer would come in here and man his station behind the planesman. Uh, one, the other bridge watch man, the basic seaman from the bridge watch would come down and operate main ballast tank number five. Okay. And then you would have, um, your friendly neighborhood, Santa Gast, who's back here, it would be operating main ballast tank number one, which is here. We'll cover that next video. So he'd be down here. So you'd act, you'd have those, the, the planes been down here. You'd have, um, your, your additional control room mate would come in here and operate. We'll cover the levers that were up here in the next video, but he would help out back here, the additional control room mate. There were two of those. So he would come in here. Um, you would, and then you would have, that would be sort of your personnel. Oh, and then you'd always, the other guy I actually forgot about was there was typically one um, e-motor machinist who was more of a battery specialist. And he hung out typically up in the control room was his watch because this location gives him ready access to the forward battery and the after battery, which is the after battery is actually under the petty officer's quarters. So he would be sort of orbiting around here and doing his maintenance and, and oversight of the batteries. So that would be his duty station as well. So that's an additional guy I forgot about. Okay. So dive situation that's that's who you typically have here now battle station situation you've got you actually got several more people up here right you've got potentially your helmsman is down here depending on what your you know whether you're being pursued or not or whether he needs to be down here you'd have your you'd have your combat planesmen there were actually men that were particularly adept at the hydroplanes who were designated combat planesmen they'd be here your control roommate would be here. Your other control roommate would be actually in here as well, back here. Your, that's Antalagast who was on duty would be here. The navigator would be up in the tower. If it were a submerged attack, the navigator would actually be up here with the commander. Or he'd be up on the bridge for a, um, for a uh, night attack situation. So he'd be up there. Um, the bosun would be up at the TDC. Uh, but then he'd also have your first watch officer would be typically down here and he'd be sort of standing down here, you know, relaying orders, making, giving, just giving general oversight into the control room, um, possibly operating the switch boxes here for fire control. He'd be doing that. Um, and you'd have your, um, so that's, that's, that's who you, you would have sort of on battle stations. So like in a battle stations type situation underwater, you'd have somewhere to the something to the tune of like 11 guys in the control room all all told okay that's a lot a lot of people down here uh during like a submerged battle stations type of situation okay um i should probably also mention just a little bit about sort of diving stations as they were on the boats um if you play the game u-boat you've got your guys your avatars in that game walking back and forth sort of willy-nilly that was not the case at diet men had particular diving stations and they typically stayed at those diving stations until they were uh unless they needed to move around the boat for whatever reason maybe to relieve an, a watch or something like that they would actually have to stop at these hatches here so these are the two watertight bulkhead uh high pressure watertight uh, hatches in the boat are the control room hatches they would actually have to stop and, and yell in here you know Ein Mann Buchraum, like if one guy had to go to the bow room, he'd say, Ein Mann Buchraum, and then the, the chief engineer would say, yeah, genehmigt, or whatever, and like, yeah, that's fine. Because he needs to know that. If one man moves forward, that's going to upset his trim. It doesn't seem like it would, but it actually trim was actually a very delicate thing. So he needed, the chief engineer needed to permit people, uh, and the same thing if one guy's coming from forward, Ein Mann nach Achtern, you know, Ein Mann Heckraum, I want one man... I need to go through here to the aft torpedo room. Yeah, okay. You know, can can ski in or whatever. Like you can go through there, and then the chief engineer would be telling him that because he would now be cognizant of the fact that he may need to give an order for flooding forward or aft or whatever. So that's actually another little known thing is that 
you know, all that type of movement throughout the boat needed to be approved by the chief engineer at diving stations because he needed to know that for his trim. Okay, so that's about all I'm going to cover in this video. It's probably, a, I don't know how long I've been talking, but that seems like a tremendously long video. But again, chock full of information. Um, I tried to cover as much as as I could up here in terms of things that would possibly be of interest or be certainly important. So if you have any questions about this, the next video I'm going to cover um, the aft part of the control room. I was going to cover, and then this, this video was going to actually be about the um, listening room and the radio room, but uh, Neil reached out to me, and so they're actually, since because they were going to uh, be implementing all of the radio equipment here relatively soon, uh, to hold off so that I'm not doing it on an empty uh, set of rooms. And so I totally understand that. So I decided, well, let's just go to the control room and we'll go from there. So um, so that is that is the control room, forward portion of the control room. If you have any questions, let me know. Happy to answer any questions in the comments or whatever the case may be. All right, take care.